Welcome to Japan, or Nippon, as it is called in Japanese, is referred to as the fluid mosaic model theory. Facts on alcohol can help you make the right choice. After all, the choice is yours. This major highway is the revolution of impressionism. Educational video network. Bringing students a world of knowledge. Visualize this. When you wake up in the morning, you notice that things are very quiet. Too quiet. You know you're late, but realize that your clock radio is dead, so you don't know how late you are. When you rush downstairs, you find that the microwave, the blender, and even the coffee maker aren't working. You flip on the TV to catch the morning news, but the TV and the radio are not functioning. What's going on? It looks like you're going to be even later than you thought, because out in the garage, the car won't start. And you can't call anyone because the phone is dead. But don't worry, because it's turning out to be such a bad day at your school or workplace that it won't really matter if you're late. There are no working computers, no modems, no internet, no cellular phones or fax machines, and no copiers or pagers. Okay, look on the bright side. There's no school or work, so you might think you have a whole day of relaxation ahead of you. But wait, you check. And every TV, video game, and CD player in the house is a useless chunk of plastic. Outside, there do seem to be a few older model cars on the streets, but they're having trouble getting anywhere because the traffic lights are out. Cars are piling up at the intersections, but the police, fire trucks, and ambulances are unable to communicate or be dispatched because none of their radios are working. This is getting serious. When you walk across the street to the store, they are completing transactions in cash and recording them on paper because their cash registers don't work anymore, and their credit card validation system is dead. You find that your ATM card is useless too. The banks are shut down, as are the video stores, the appliance stores, and the movie theaters. Later, you find out that it's not just your neighborhood or your town; it's everywhere. Wall Street. The stock market is quiet and empty. No phones. No computers. No displays in operation. All the airlines are out of business. Without the air traffic control systems and all the internal circuitry, the big jetliners are just immobile hunks of metal. The hospitals are running on a limited and emergency basis, without their computers, X-rays, and diagnostic machines. Without the CAT scan machines or the blood analysis and treatment equipment. Only very basic services can go on. Even restaurants can barely function, deprived of their computers and cash registers. Some institutions, such as our schools, libraries, and churches, may be able to adapt in a few days because they are not as heavily computerized as the commercial world, but they will still suffer. Everywhere we look, bustling, noisy, bright-lit places are now cold, and dark, and quiet. Very suddenly, almost everything in our world has changed. Our lives are slower, limited, and poorer for the loss of a little piece of plastic that we take for granted: the integrated circuit, the chip that changed the world. Of the integrated circuits, can you believe how different life would be without us? Have you ever wondered what events led to the development of the integrated circuit? Let's find out. For as long as humankind has existed, our curious and inventive minds have looked for ways to extend and enhance our control over the world. We've looked for ways to magnify or replace muscle power for difficult or repetitive tasks, and ways to see things too small or too far away for our eyes to perceive. 
We've invented ways to tame the elements of air, earth, fire, and water to do our bidding. We have searched for better ways to record knowledge or to communicate at greater distances. We have sought ways to travel faster, carry bigger loads, and even to break the bonds of earth and fly. Each of these advances in technology has changed our societies, our lives, and our world in dramatic and irrevocable ways. In the 20th century, one invention changed our world more than anything that came before, the integrated circuit. The technological development that occurred in the second half of the 20th century changed almost every aspect of our world. Although a number of these machines existed in crude forms before the introduction of the integrated circuit, such as radio sets and televisions, radar, microwaves, computers, and telephones, it wasn't until the development of the integrated circuit that other electronic wonders could exist, like cellular phones, navigational systems, personal computers, digital watches, satellites, and space travel, just to name a few. In this video, we'll put the integrated circuit into historical perspective and we'll look at how it was developed. We'll examine how ICs are made and how they work. Finally, we'll explore some of the amazing things they enable us to do. The roots of the development of the integrated circuit reach all the way back past the turn of the century. In the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution changed the world with mechanical devices such as the steam engine, the mechanical loom, the internal combustion engine, and assembly lines. But as business became more mechanized, the need to count things, to store and retrieve information, and to communicate at a distance became more and more important. At the beginning of the 20th century, an Italian inventor, Giulielmo Marconi transmitted the first radio message across the Atlantic Ocean. Most early radio equipment used vacuum tubes, which were developed by Lee de Forest in 1906. Vacuum tubes proved to have many other uses in amplifiers, x-ray tubes, and eventually television. The first primitive television broadcast systems appeared in the 1920s, but it wasn't until the 1940s that commercial broadcasting and home television systems began to appear. In 1946, there were about 6,000 television sets in the United States. By 1948, there were over 3 million, and by 1951, there were more than 12 million. Vacuum tubes had many uses, but there were some drawbacks. They used a lot of power, were bulky, generated heat, and were delicate and unreliable. Vacuum tubes were also used in the early 1940s to create the first electronic computing devices. These early computers, such as ENIAC or ORDVAC, were developed to do artillery calculations for the military or to decode enemy communications. They were so large that they took up whole rooms, and they created so much heat that the air conditioners needed to cool them used as much electricity as the computer itself. Also, the tubes burned out like light bulbs, needing constant replacement. The ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, was the first electronic computer took up 1,500 square feet, weighed about 30 tons, and used around 30,000 vacuum tubes. It replaced 200 women punching numbers eight hours a day into mechanical calculators. It could perform 5,000 operations per second, but had to be wired up differently for every problem, which took days, and it had no way of storing programs or answers. By 1951, a better version called Univac, Universal Automatic Computer, was developed for the U.S. Census Bureau. It was the first machine to use magnetic tape to store data and programs instead of millions of cards with holes punched in them. But it could only run for about 10 minutes at a time before a vacuum tube burned out or some other malfunction stopped the run. In 1948, something called the transistor was invented by three scientists, John Bardeen, William Shockley, and Walter Bratain. They received the Nobel Prize in 1956 for this accomplishment. About the size of a thumbtack, the transistor used a tiny slice of silicon to do the same kind of switching and amplification that a vacuum tube did. While using less electricity, it worked faster, didn't generate all the heat, and hardly ever burned out. Electronics research and equipment manufacturers moved ahead quickly using these little devices. 
In the early 1950s, the transistor began to appear in radios, TVs, and phonographs. The transistor's tiny size and reduced power requirements made it possible to create affordable portable radios and TVs, car radios and tape players. Transistors replaced tubes in almost every type of device, but it was in computers that they made the biggest difference, making them smaller, more powerful, and affordable by businesses of every kind. Tradic, the first fully transistorized computer, was developed by Bell Labs in 1955. It replaced tubes with 800 transistors, used about 1 20th the electricity of a comparable vacuum tube computer, and generated virtually no heat. As business customers constantly wanted more speed, more memory, and more power, the computer designers and builders began to run up against some of the limitations of transistors. They still had to be wired together and as small as they were, only so many transistors can fit into a given space or circuit board. And every soldered connection was a possible point of failure. Both vacuum tubes and transistors were connected together on something called a printed circuit. Instead of using wires and solder to connect every part of an electronic device, a copper-plated circuit board would have a pattern of connecting lines drawn or printed onto it with a substance called a resist. The board was then dipped into a corrosive chemical that dissolved or etched the copper away, leaving only the parts covered by the resist. This development made circuits more compact, easier to produce, and more dependable. Then came the real breakthrough that changed everything, me. In 1958, a scientist named Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments figured a way to put not just transistors, but complete circuits all on one slice of germanium, another semiconductor material like silicon. It looked crude, but the experimental device proved that amplifiers and radios, as well as digital circuits for computers, could be built this way. The next year, Robert Noyce devised a better way to connect the elements on an integrated circuit, using layers of different materials to make more complex circuits. Integrated circuits quickly became more reliable, easier to mass produce, and more affordable. It now became possible to put an entire amplifier, control system, or even a computer on one piece of silicon. Introduced in 1971, the Intel 4004 chip was the world's first microprocessor. It had the equivalent of 2,300 transistors inside. Every year, the number of electronic components that could be packed into a chip has increased. The Pentium Pro processor introduced in 1996 boasted 5.5 million transistors. The transistors on these chips are so small that they are measured in microns. A micron is one millionth of a meter, about one one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. The 4004 chip had transistors that were about 10 microns in size. The Pentium Pro has transistors that are only 0.32 microns. Personal computers, one that an average person could afford and use, have only been around since about 1978. They've gotten more powerful every year since then, and the relative cost has decreased radically. Remember, the ENIAC computer in 1946 cost over half a million dollars and could perform about 5,000 operations per second. Today's home computers start at around $1,000 and routinely perform hundreds of millions of operations per second. How are integrated circuits made? Silicon made from sand is melted down and made to grow into large, very pure crystals. These crystals are sliced up into very thin circular wafers and polished to a mirror smooth finish. In its pure form, silicon will not conduct electricity. So chemicals are used to implant impurities into the silicon to begin the process of creating an integrated circuit. Then a series of layers of substances are deposited onto the wafer. Integrated circuits use a refinement of the process mentioned earlier, where the printed circuit board used a resist substance to cover the areas of the copper needed to connect the parts of the circuit. Because the circuit diagrams are so small, the patterns are projected onto the wafer like a photographic negative. The parts that the light shines on are hardened, then the rest of the pattern is dissolved away. By alternating layers of insulating material with layers of conducting material, 
millions of tiny electronic components, the transistors, resistors, capacitors, and connecting leads are all formed in an incredible complex maze that makes it possible to shrink a room full of equipment into a chip the size of your thumbnail. Hundreds of these circuits are formed on one silicon wafer. Any that don't perform correctly are simply thrown away. This process is now highly automated both in production and testing, one of the reasons that the cost of integrated circuits continues to drop. Because these components are so tiny and the process requires so much precision, all the work is done in clean rooms, over a thousand times cleaner than the cleanest surgical operating room. They are then cut apart and packaged inside the little plastic chips that we see everywhere. How do integrated circuits work? Before we look at the workings of an IC, let's understand a little more about transistors. Think of each transistor as a little switch. A low current means the switch is open, represented as zero, so no current flows through it. If a high voltage is present, current can flow through, making a one. Remember, everything a computer does can be broken down to on and off, ones and zeros. Different combinations of these microscopic switches make up something called logic gates. These are able to add or subtract, to multiply or divide, or to compare numbers or symbols. For example, an AND gate says that A and B must be true for C to be true. An OR gate says that if A or B is true, then C is true. So different combinations can do very complex calculations and comparisons. Transistors can also be used to measure and control electronic signals or the flow of electricity, to amplify weak signals, to store and retrieve information, and a host of other functions. The integrated circuit is just a way to shrink millions of these transistors and all the other components into a small, reliable package. Although there are many thousands of different types of integrated circuits, the one that has probably had the biggest effect on our world is the microprocessor chip because it made possible the personal computer. How has the chip helped to advance technology? It's probably safe to say we'd never have gone to the moon if it weren't for the IC. Without the savings in weight, size, and energy needs made possible by miniaturized computers, monitoring, and control devices, the spacecraft would never have left the ground. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. The astronauts would never have walked on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Or return safely. The American space program would never have advanced as quickly or achieved so much without the miniaturization made possible by the integrated circuit. The satellites, receivers, and computers that enable us to do things like monitor and predict the weather, choose from hundreds of TV channels, observe military or climatic events anywhere in the world, or to study distant stars, all use state-of-the-art ICs to perform their miraculous accomplishments. The field of medicine uses computers for diagnostic equipment that allow doctors to see inside our bodies in ways that x-rays never could. Even something as simple as a digital thermometer works faster and much more accurately than a glass thermometer. Computers are behind many of the recent advances in drug research, types of treatment, and faster, more accurate diagnoses. Microelectronics are being used to restore sight and hearing to create prosthetic arms and legs that look and work like the real thing. Integrated circuits are implanted inside our bodies to dispense medicine automatically, to control seizures, or to regulate heartbeats. Chips have gotten so powerful that information is now being processed and manipulated as pure digital signals. CDs, or compact audio discs, introduced in 1982, were the forerunners of today's digital TVs, digital video recorders, and digital video discs and the devices continue to get smaller. A digital camcorder, a camera, a video monitor, and a recording and playback device with special effects now fits in the palm of your hand.
Film cameras are being nudged aside by the new flood of digital cameras that enable us to play back our pictures instantly or feed them into our computers for other uses. Computers have revolutionized our schools, and as more and more schools are connected to the Internet, students are not just restricted to textbooks or passive learning, they can now talk to scientists, download real data on weather, volcanoes, or space missions. Millions of students worldwide watch the Mars rover land and begin its exploration. Students have access to virtually the entire knowledge base of humankind. Microprocessors are being built into most appliances now. Cars today can have as many as six computers to control everything from ignition and fuel and air mixture to the air conditioning and the suspension. The computers can even help in diagnosis and repair. Some of the sophisticated video games we play have integrated circuits more powerful than the most potent home computers. ICs are now in many of today's toys, allowing them to talk, play digitized sounds, or interact with us. Hikers, pilots, and sailors are now using these GPS, Global Positioning System instruments, for navigation and safety. Inexpensive handheld devices can now communicate with satellites to pinpoint our exact locations. The military used GPS's heavily in the Gulf War. Soon our cars will have global positioning systems with map screens that will show us where we are and how to get to where we're going. The robots predicted in the science fiction of the 1950s haven't taken over all our jobs, but robotic devices do weld and paint cars, defuse bombs, machine parts with incredible precision, and perform many tasks that are too dangerous or too rapid for humans. The integrated circuit is becoming so widespread, so inexpensive, so powerful that we are beginning to take it for granted. Calculators that once cost hundreds of dollars are given away. Chips are in our credit cards, our digital watches, our phones, our pocket computing devices. The cellular phones and cellular modems that allow us to communicate and compute from almost anywhere in the world would not exist without powerful custom integrated circuits. Soon children will grow up in a world where words like typewriter, LP record, or 35 millimeter film will have no more significance than butter churn or buggy whip do today. The integrated circuit is changing every aspect of our lives and there's no turning back. Our lives are better, safer, and longer because of the integrated circuit, the chip that changed the world. you know a little bit more about where we came from and how we work. Well, see you later. I got work to do. <laughs>